Re, 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 ready. Check. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, yeah, you know it's a go. Okay, I see they going off, but we gon' rewrite it though. That's right. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, yeah, you know it's a go. Okay, I see they going off, but we gon' rewrite it though. That's right. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, yeah, you know it's a go. Okay, I see they going off, but we gon' rewrite it though. I said Monday, Wednesday, Friday, yeah, you know it's a go. Okay, I see they going off, but we gon' rewrite it though. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the Rewriters Room. We are the men with the pen. I am Armand Sather, a.k.a. the Paul Heyman of podcasting, a.k.a. the John Cena of journalism, a.k.a. the Brock Lesnar of bald nigga ballers. Now, I have another moniker that I'm going by. It involves my three, uh, us, the trio. However, we are missing one, and I will get into it. Actually, I'll get into it now. So when uh, one, one of our guys are missing, CeCe, I made the mistake in referring to him as the Dean Ambrose of the Shield because he left us for greener pastures only to come back. However, being that we have now been left by Channing, you are not the Dean Ambrose. You are the Seth Rollins. Channing is the Dean Ambrose, and that aligns with him because if there's anyone who is the mid-carter of the Shield, it was Dean Ambrose. But I think most of all, I am excited because that now makes me the Roman Reigns of this trio and my, my name and Roman na- Roman's names are pretty similar. So it, it, it works out, but let me introduce my guy. CC, how you feeling, man? How, how you feeling Seth Rollins? Hey man, what's good? It's CC, the best rapper and producer in the whole wide world. God body, because I consume healthy products and do towel curls, benevolent servant to the earth and philanthropist. And every phrase that I say is a gem like amethyst. You can put any nigga next to me. Any nigga. Pick your favorite nigga, your daddy, you know, put him next to me. In the kitchen with you and your moms, your sister, your auntie, you know, and your grandma. Every one of them niggas going to look at him and be like, whose man is this? I may talk a lot, but I only got one thing to say. Love yourself and keep going. You are the world. So give all you can. Take care of your people, your body and your land. And all I got to say to what you just said is, oh, 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 come on. Seth, I'll go. I'll take Seth Rollins, aka Mr. Crowd Control himself. Hey man, that's a that's a great person to be, to be honest. So um, it's not a it's it's not a slight in any way. Um, but yeah, we're back. It's Channing Channing is uh, handling some business uh, overseas, underseas, across the seas, well, whatever seas he's doing, he, he's handling some stuff elsewhere. So it's just us today. But don't worry, that just means that. Rather than having three times the fun, you're going to have twice the fun. So it's a little less fun, but we're going to compensate. We are together, we're going to make up Channing holding it down for mid Car Mafia. And he's got some things to be excited about for mid Midcar Mafia, which we will touch on a little later. Of course, we got to plug our Patreon. If you are not subscribed to Patreon backslash the A-Show RNC, then you are missing out on the X8 Diaries. You're missing out on Spot Callers. You're missing out on Legendary Run. You're missing out on exclusive scoops coming from J5 and Meals on the A-Show. You're missing out on extra content from The War Report with Cyrus and Quan. You are missing out on engaging with us and answering some very fun questions that are asked on the Patreon. So what are you waiting for? Hit the link, subscribe, get this content, be tapped in. Join our Discord. We are Our Discord community is growing by the week. I love it. We have so many great wrestling minds in there, people who uh, expose us to different perspectives. And uh, it's fun. We have a lot of fun, a lot of safe fun, a lot of responsible fun. Speaking of some responsible fun, I'm going to just get into mine, man. Uh, this, this, this past Monday, it was exciting to see my dog, Finn, Finn Balor, got that U.S. title opportunity. Everyone was like, he going to lose, he, but he going to get it at WrestleMania. No, 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 no. We're pressing that button now. Finn Balor defeated Damian Priest, ending a reign that got a little got a little stale for me. You know, Damian came in, hot baby face, the big bad bunny co-sign, beating The Miz, beat Sheamus at SummerSlam. Like, it was, it was all great. It was all great to me. And then they tried that split personality thing, and it just kind of got really repetitive. There was no progression with it. There was there, It seemed like there was no ending to it. It was like, okay, maybe eventually they're going to do the, if he gets a squad fight, he loses the title thing. And they didn't go through with it. So it's like, you know what? Sometimes you just got to have the person get beat. But we saw that in Damian Priest getting beat. That just brought out his evil side even more, and he beat up Finn after the match. And this will presumably be 
an extended thing that will go to WrestleMania. Now, will they make it a multi-man match? They love doing that. I think you have two compelling superstars to where you you can keep these two keep these two at it. You know, Finn Finn playing the babyface role this time. Damian going full heel. We we haven't seen that yet. Like Damian came in, but like we said, was was uh, teamed up with Bad Bunny. They they, they were the you know the, the bright lit, but you know having all the hoes, baby faces, and then now we get to see Evil Damian. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward. Just I'm happy that Finn is in a substantial storyline. I've been waiting for this. The matches with Theory or whatever, but now now we're here. Finn got another title under his belt. All he needs is to be a tag team champion, and he will be Grand Slam Finn. So I was very very happy with that. And it was it was a good match too. Like we're talking about everything surrounding it. The match itself was very very good. So I'm I'm very happy for my dog Finn. Yeah, man. I uh, it was um it was weird because I wanted. <laughs> I, in order to like really feel the payoff, I wanted like another five minutes. Like I wanted just another five minutes, but that only spoke to like what you said, like with the match being pretty good. Um, yeah, I, it's funny because I, I just finished like watching that, the uh, watching that shit. Um, so it's very fresh for me. Um, I knew it was gonna happen soon as like uh, they came out uh, or whatever. I knew that was gonna happen when they made actually way back when they switched to to Damian Priest like being two different things i was like oh they about to shut this shit down like because soon as they they came out with that i was like this gimmick is not gonna work like i know it's not gonna work because in order for you to make it work one he still has the title i feel like the gimmick doesn't work with the title um yeah. i don't know why it's hard to explain no i i, I agree i, I yeah, agree him it's, coming it's in, weird yeah, him coming in as a babyface champion, then all of a sudden switching gimmicks, like while he has the title, like, and then nothing caused that. It all that happened too of? fast. It happened too fast. It, it wasn't like a random match or like T Bar. It was like, I don't, like, we don't really care about seeing T Bar on TV. You got to make it like, have him go against the Miz, and the Miz makes him tap into his evil side. Like, and he, he had exactly. some singles matches with Miz prior to that, but like, make it someone where it's like, it's an understandable shift, like Seth Rollins, KO, someone like that, where yeah. it's it feels bigger. They just like made it happen off one match with T Bar, and then he faced T Bar again, and then he was just doing this with everyone else. But it was like there was really nothing behind it except oh, he's just getting ticked off in his matches. Like I, I don't yeah. know, it, it was a big lack of story. <laughs> and to and to be perfectly honest, this kind of speaks to another point that I feel. Um, which is that management is being underused as um, as a uh, a way of pushing the story forward. It, to me, it doesn't make any sense that uh, Sonya Deville and um, Adam Pierce are only involved in like some things on screen. Um, now, obviously, you don't want a situation where every single thing that's happening is surround like is like surrounds the management person or people. Or whatever. Um, I'm watching Raw 99 right now. It's hilarious. The matches, uh, uh-uh, but the story is amazing. It's very, very funny. But um, the thing that makes it funny in the first place is because it's very like they're playing into the reality of it, which is that Mr. McMahon runs the company. These people work for him, and technically, he can like have them do whatever they want. I mean, whatever he wants. Now, with him, Sonya, and Adam showing up on camera as much as they do, um, that's a piece on the chessboard that you can use for certain things, right? So if you have Damian Priest and he's switching his gimmick up uh, mid-title defense run, um, why not have the thing that provokes him either be a, like, like you said, a superstar that really gets under his skin, or maybe it's the fact that management keeps putting him in these shitty situation matches and then like he keeps snapping like or like he's in the middle of a match he's about to win and then like there's a stipulation where he has to do x y and z that mm-hmm. way you keep the fans on his side from when he still switches or whatever because the fans were on his side when he was still switching and it, even though it was kind of weird and you could tell they didn't know how they were supposed to feel but yeah. if you do it that way then they know and then you can have him lose a championship really turn heel or whatever and then maybe he joins management or you know kind of goes rogue or whatever on his own but i i say all that to say it's just like the gimmick switch fell flat i was ready for him to drop the title i just wanted five more minutes out of that match 
And um, I think th this whole thing with Finn and that title is not just limited to uh, Damian Priest and that feud that's going to happen. I think this is Finn getting back in the good graces of Vince. This nigga's about to be like he's about to. I don't think he's. I'm not saying he's going to make like a, a title run, uh, like a main title run at all, but. He's like the disrespect is stopping. Like this nigga is not about to take pins, <laughs> whatever, just to randoms anymore. Like this is not happening for a bit because there was a good year and a half. This nigga was just like even to like even uh, in that past match, people thought he might lose or whatever. Yeah. And when you look yeah. at it on paper, it's like, yo, this nigga was the first universal champion. Why would he lose to Damian Priest, this new nigga who only won this U.S. title? Like that don't make no sense. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, and then that's what they reminded you of. But at the, they're building him back up. So I'm glad to see Finn uh, build back on that level to where he's getting back into the the top of the mid card slash like the main event. Um, honestly, I think the top of the mid card slash main event best suits him until someone who is at the main event level gets that title or like he can kind of do a few like mm -hmm. what we're about to see with Edge and AJ. Mm -hmm. um, if unless he like has the counterpart like that, I think that top of the, of the mid card, like very, very top of the mid card to the bottom of the, the main event is is exactly where it belongs. And I'm, I'm happy to see that you did it, man. I, I yeah. just hope that with the Damian Priest stuff that they turn it away. I just had this wild ass idea that there's a couple of like edgy rock star people in the in the company. It would be, I just thought like, what if they just started a faction and shit? You just see Rhea and um, Damian Priest and some other edgy people just <laughs> hanging out backstage. And these niggas is like the goth kids at high school or some shit. <laughs> That'd be dope. I'm, but like uh, you bringing up like Ed, Edge and AJ, it makes me think like one of my early predictions for the next Money in the Bank holder was Riddle, but mm. Finn is also a pick for that. I I don't, I don't know if he's gonna go along with the U.S. title. If if he loses it, I'll feel even more confident in my pick that he's gonna be he's gonna be win the Money in the Bank. And honestly, he could win it when he has the U.S. title too, and then drop the title, end up cashing in. Because with, with this unification thing, like the, the thought is, are they gonna make a new belt for Raw? Are, are they gonna still have it be two belts that Roman has to defend at the same pay-per-view? Like what, what exactly is going to be, well, you know, the way that they operate? They're, they're saying unification, but I'm just like, I, I, I with Fox and USA being split, I, I don't know if it's going to be one title. Like Raw is going to have to get something. So um, I think there, there's a possibility where Roman's def defending both titles. He faces Finn. He faces someone else. He, he beats the first guy and then Finn and then Brock comes back and interferes and beats Roman and then Finn wins that match. But also I thought about this. Edge has never been United States champion as far as I know. So if we're going to get Finn versus Edge, for, for that U.S. title, I, I I wouldn't put it past Edge to 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 try to get that Grand Slam before he uh, before he hangs up for. I'm, I'm thinking I he's never been U.S. champion. No, I I don't think he ever has. So hey man, like but like he Finn was one of the guys that he uh, alluded to in that promo two weeks ago. So I I think the streets would love to see Finn versus Edge. A Finn Edge AJ triple threat would be good. A Finn Edge, AJ, uh, da Damian Priest, Fatal Four Way would be good. You could throw Cody in there, like, you, like give us, give us a, a six pack challenge with all those great performers, and sprinkle in Seth Rollins and KO for the fuck of it. Like, there's so many different things you could do. Um, so yeah, I mean, Chan, bro, I mean, Mid Card Mafia is looking great, and we got Ricochet, who's been announced as the the number two babyface on SmackDown. He's getting a push. He's getting a IC title match against Sami Zayn, like. You know, on the one hand, it kind of shows that SmackDown is really lacking because it goes from Drew to Ricochet. But at the same time, it's like, hey, man, n n next man up. And Ricochet is that next man up. And he, I, I think him him and Sammy are going to give us give us something pretty good. And, uh, you know, maybe this will be Ricochet's time to get a belt again. It's been about two years since he's held, held some gold. So maybe this is time. So, yeah, Midcar Moff is a good, good chance. Don't worry. We're, we're holding it down for you with the with the Midcar report. Uh, what you got for us? I'm stupid. <laughs> what you got for us, CC? Yeah, man. Um, bruh, my my guy, Ridge, Ridge, homie Quan. Um, <laughs> I know that this is part of the process. My, my thing is you're supposed to fall in love with the process, and mm -hmm. I'm falling in boredom with the process. Mm -hmm. Um, I know he's with Seamus because he's learning the ropes and all that stuff. Um, 
But my thing is like, I see there's two ways this can go. He can get a like he can learn how to, you know, do the personality thing, um, get that up and going, like become a good talker and then go out there and perform and then, you know, have his whole career. Or he can just be like another one of the guys that came in. We thought he was something and, you know, not really going anywhere. I actually um, I actually like Rich Holland. He's cool. Um, I like him a lot. I think. Yeah, he's to be honest, like if you have to build a roster that like when if you have to build a roster, you kind of like you kind of benefit from you really do benefit from having a, a rich Holland. Um, but the thing that I'm noticing or whatever is that I'm just getting bored. Like I'm literally getting bored to the point where I see him and Seamus on screen. I don't give a shit because I know exactly what's about to happen. They're either about to win or lose, but either way, it's going to be like some weird thing. And then I know, where, and we all know where this is heading to. Him and Seamus are going to have a falling out, blah, blah, blah. They're going to have their match or whatever, put on a, a match, and then Rich Holland's going to go from there or whatever. That's that's the obvious route. There's a couple other ways they can go, but that's the obvious route. And my thing is, because they hinted to it already with uh, with um, with Seamus pushing them down and all that stuff, um but my thing is like if you're gonna have him go solo um have him go solo for real for real and don't like just kind of like put him out there just to put him out there like I pr- I think he probably might need more work I haven't heard him talk a lot and I also missed um some episodes that I know he's been on mm-hmm. um but at the same time um every time I see him it's just I don't get that feeling of oh there's rich holland it's like mm-hmm. oh there's rich holland is he gonna like are they gonna have him do something and then yeah. he goes out and he wrestles a little bit and you know he has a thing with Seamus. like bro first of all that little club thing that he has and and the uh the uh the hat that he wears and like mm-hmm. the whole get up or whatever fam it's like it's not working for me <laughs> like there's there's other stuff that you can do with this guy. Like yeah. I mean, you've done it with other guys similar to his style. Mm-hmm. I think um, I just think if he sticks with it too long, it could end up biting him in the ass or whatever. But I just I want I want to see you do a win. So I just hope it turns out OK. But I'm at the point where I'm getting concerned and I'm ready to be like, all right, listen, man, we got to do something with this because mm-hmm. it's not really working. And I really want like his shit to work out i, I mean i i know it will it's just i'm i know this is a part of the process i'm just getting bored as hell with this shit i'm getting bored no 100 man i think um it's uh it calling him rich homie kwan is perfect because if, if we look at look at things now young thug is up here rich homie kwan is unfortunately you know and the, there is a there, there's a significant gap obviously between him and Seamus. Seamus is kind of like that guy who's on TV regularly, he's cool. He's definitely, he, he's, he's been great the last two years. I got nothing wrong with Seamus. But having Ridge as his understudy, it hasn't elevated Ridge in any way. Like you think about AJ and Omas. Omas was elevated, but by AJ Styles without really talking. Ridge don't talk. Ridge fights matches. His matches are serviceable. They're passable. They're not really that great. My thing, I, I just looked up who was in that um, Fatal 4-Way tag team match when, when uh, Viking Raiders became number one contenders. Why were Sheamus and Ridge not in that match? Sheamus and Ridge, uh, like another way to get them active would be to have them in the tag team division. The SmackDown tag team division, well, look at who was in that match. Viking Raiders, Los Lotharios, Cesaro and Mansoor, Jinder Mahal and Shanky. You could have easily taken out Jinder Mahal and Shanky and put in Sheamus and and, uh, Ridge. And their story there, because Cesaro was in that match. Like there's a lot of different things that you could have done. Um, And honestly, and J5 talks about it all the time, bringing up Ridge without Pete Dunne was so stupid. Like Pete don't really like, of course you want to have veterans down there in in 2.0 to have them, you know, helping the new guys to get acclimated. These Pete Dunne and freaking um, the the, the Italian dude, I'm not forgetting his name. Um, uh, To Tony D'Angelo, Tony D'Angelo. These matches are, they're not doing anything for me. Like, and I, I, I don't really feel like Tony's character is being helped or his, his in ring is being helped by Pete either. Like, and it's, it's taking away from what you could be doing with Pete. You could have Pete up there going toe to toe with Sami Zayn, going toe to toe with Shinsuke Nakamura. You could have him on raw, but smack SmackDown really needs people who are not just playing second fiddle to guys that were already used to 
like I like I I wouldn't really want to see Sheamus in the Intercontinental title picture, but I would like to see Ridge get to the point where I'm like, he he's a viable contender. Put him against Sammy. Put him against Shinsuke. And it's it, I I I don't know if they have long term plans, but this right now is not it. And Ridge is capable. I, I really liked Ridge when he was in NXT. Like when he was in NXT, he felt like a big deal. Like he he he, he was main events and shows. You know, walking out with the, it, it was like, oh shit, Rich Rich Holland's fighting someone. Like yo, they about to get cooked. Now it's just like, oh, that, that that's Ridge, Sheamus's buddy. Like, come on, man. Like, we, we gotta right. get it together. You already got it. Work like you want to know what it looks like when it works. Happy Corbin and Mad Cat Moss. That's what it looks like when it works. Like I, them niggas could stay together for another two years. I wouldn't give a shit. That shit works. <laughs> like it's just something about this that just don't hit like that. But yeah. if you look at it, like from the very beginning when he got introduced, when Mad Cat got introduced um, with the character. Um, he immediately got introduced with something that like he had a thing, like he told jokes or whatever. He's fun. like him and like him and Corbin actually seem like they're friends on the same level. It's just mm-hmm. that Mad Caps quote unquote new or whatever. Yeah. Whereas Rich Holland really feels like Seamus is fucking son, my nigga. Yeah. And you can't have a nigga that big out there being somebody <laughs> else's son. Cause then we're going to be like, Oh, that's nigga. I ain't even worried about you. Get, get your damn daddy. Like yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how, and you don't want that in a wrestler that you're trying to push. So yeah, yeah man, they, it's not they're not on the same level hopefully they realize it very very soon um and i hope they do something with it because ridge holland should be out should be out here being ass yeah. like that's his that was that would be his number one stick he got the fucking face for it he got the size for it or whatever he got the move set for it the power it's, like everything is there yeah it's just putting him in positions where he feels more important like he's not the oh Seamus and Ridge of course they're doing something with Ricochet and now Ricochet don't got Cesaro like so what, what, what I, I don't know where it's gonna go <laughs> I don't know I don't know where it's gonna go um let's jump into this free ride so or, originally Bob uh Brock Lesnar was slated to defend the WWE title against Bobby Lashley at Madison Square Garden this upcoming Saturday I wish uh a show that I will be going to very excited uh looks like Bobby is not we don't know if he's cleared yet. Um, I'm not sure because uh, Paul and and the promotions for it have said Brock Lesnar will defend the WWE title. It's not saying who he's defending against. So being that it's a live show and they can kind of do whatever, like it's, it's, it's dope that they've been alluding to a live show on weekly TV because there's usually a lot of like separation between the two. But the fact that they're alluding to this, they're making it a big deal. And I feel like with that, knowing that you're trying to sell tickets, knowing that people are going to find some way to be tapped in, you got to get a contender who makes sense for Brock Lesnar. So who would you put Brock Lesnar against to defend the WWE title on Saturday at MSG on the road to WrestleMania? Eddie Kingston. No, nah, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bruh, I... Honestly, I really don't know. It's um this is a this is a really really tough one. Um cuz my first thing was like <laughs> the first thing I thought was have Seth go up against Brock, slay the beast again and then uh get in Roman's head for the unification thing or whatever and then mm-hmm. like have that be a thing but like maybe brock gets it back or something or like maybe Seth just loses because like seth's always like going behind ko's back and getting opportunities for himself or whatever but he already cast in his chip where it's like you go and you talk to management and you get your championship match or whatever um so for me like when i think about who can go against him i honestly don't i don't like i don't I don't think anybody's really like a, a real viable choice yeah, <laughs> at <man>. this point. <laughs> like I can't, I honestly like hell, like I honestly can't pick anybody. Like there is uh there is really no one that I can think of. And it doesn't like, and to me, it even for like the last, like here's here's the thing. You I don't think there's anybody that you can put up against him right now that would make sense in a way where it's like i think that person can win against him right um because then you also have to look at like who's um who's involved in like other stuff or whatever right so i think that you're really your only option at that point is to go to somebody who we know won't win or whatever but it's like oh just to see him like kind of have a chance against him or whatever yeah so i literally have only one pick 
Um, and I don't know if he's like cleared to, I don't know if he's like healed and stuff and he can wrestle yet or whatever, but I just saw him on TV. So my guess is he's all right. Um, Austin Theory. Hmm. Have Austin Theory just go do it. Have him go up, get destroyed <laughs> by Brock, but make it look like he has a chance for like two seconds or whatever, if we get destroyed by Brock and then we'll just, you know, we'll call it that and we'll bring that back somewhere later down the the line or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like that'll just be a part of like Austin's story on a come up or whatever. Like when he gets to the title at one point, Brock will come back for it, tell him that he already beat him once. Austin would be like, I'm not the same guy. This is like two, three years from now, blah, blah, blah. You know, but aside from that, I'm like, if you look at the raw roster, it's like everyone else is kind of involved in something. If there was something yeah. somebody else that you could pick or whatever, you wouldn't even believe that they could really win against that person. You know yeah. what would be funny is if if, if Roman challenged him. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, Roman's, be Roman's defending that night against uh, Seth, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's defending against Seth. So that would be that would be fucking hilarious. Yeah, I I'm I'm thinking. AJ Styles, just because I'm thinking of the live MSG crowd and being that it's a live show and they're alluding to it, like just because they're alluding to it doesn't necessarily mean they have to make it make sense with with the weekly television stories. So you Mm -hmm. make it AJ, someone who's going to pop the crowd. It's a match that they've had before. It was a really good match. Survivor Series 2017. We know AJ is not going to win that. But 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 you create that intrigue where it's like, oh, shit. If AJ wins this, he's defending the title against Edge, who just did him dirty on Raw. Like it, it, you, you kind of just like get those wheels turned in people's heads. But mm-hmm. I, like realistically, it's it's title versus title, Roman versus Brock. Um, but yeah, no, I, I agree. This is a really tough spot. I thought Big E, but the but the, the black Twitter wrestling people would hate that because we know Big E's not winning that. I love Big E, but it's yeah. not happening. Um, I thought I thought Edge, but I, I I don't know if Edge would Edge get in the ring with Brock at this stage of his career. I don't, I don't I don't know about it. And the only other thing I was like calling a hail mary, calling John Cena, <laughs> like calling call Cena, man. I, I I would love that. I I would pop so crazy if if John Cena comes out to face Brock, even if he loses. I don't, I don't care. We haven't seen that match since what twenty fourteen. I, I don't think we've seen them in, in the ring together in quite some time so yeah give give, give me john cena versus brock lesnar i, I don't care if cena's gonna lose it brock could squash him in a minute but i, I just want to see yeah. it i i, I just want to see it co- co- a fucking cowboy brock looking at john cena i i, I just want to see it so that would be hilarious i want to hear a cena rock rap about cowboy version of brock I'm you know who's bro- another <laughs> another another potential candidate um only like t- as the candidate where it's just like oh okay this person could win like i can see how they could win um omas mm. i i, like, I actually no, thought about that too no, yeah he has no right to challenge but when you think about like you know who like could actually step in and like actually give you a chance or whatever it's like eh, maybe omas yeah yeah it would it, it would be we haven't seen brock really Go big meaty men slap him. I mean, obviously with Bobby Lashley, but like Omos is like a different type of beast. Like, like we haven't seen Brock in the ring with someone that big in quite some time. So seeing Brock pick up Omos up for an F5, seeing him hit release Germans on Omos, it'll be a great look for Omos too. So get in the ring with yes. one of the one of the best in-ring storytellers and like really coming to understand, you know, playing to the crowd and all that. Cause I'm sure Brock would be Brock would probably be. So somewhat giving to Omas, he 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 would yeah. let Omas cook him, but Brock would probably be be, be giving to him. Um, so that and think about it, like he would, and think about this too. Is like as a as a bigger guy, like one of the things I noticed. I, I'm again, I'm watching Raw ninety nine right now. One of the things I really noticed about Kane. Kane would have like a match with X Pac, and when X Pac would punch him, Kane looked like he got punched in the face real hard. Mm-hmm. Like the way he reacted, this guy's like seven one, you know, whatever, can crush the Xbox with one hand or whatever. But mm-hmm. when he gets hit, he sells. And that's the thing is just like even as a as a bigger guy or maybe even especially as a bigger guy, you really got to know how to sell mm-hmm. in order to like really make that match feel like something. So this could be an opportunity for Omas to have, a, a you know, he's been crushing people this whole time. But if he wants the longevity, he's going to have to sell because 
ev- like every you're gonna have to if you work for this company long enough you take it pens bro like mm-hmm. that's what's happening like yeah. <laughs> you can't just go to work and not take pens so you have to figure out a, or at the very least sell and make sure you know you make it look good so mm-hmm. if he wants to have a, a long career that's somebody else i can see but it's with this like short notice i like i don't know but my mm-hmm. my guess is is that my guess is that um they might have somebody like come out and like try to like go up against brock but maybe like bobby like comes in like half injured or something like that and mm. and like messes it up because he doesn't want somebody else to beat him for the championship or i don't know i just think it's going to be a fiasco to be honest mm. i think it's going to be an entertaining ass fiasco that's what mm-hmm. i think yeah yeah fucking fuck around ha- have happy corbin and mad cat moss come out or some shit <laughs> bro i i mean <laughs> at this point you really got to call up the call ups, but this is also an opportunity, like you said, like how you like John Cena could come back or mm-hmm. whatever and have like you could. I mean, I don't know. You might they might pull a rabbit out of a hat and have some random person that you really didn't see coming, which mm-hmm. I would love to see. That's what I love about uh, wrestling is, is that surprise. Like I remember I was watching the Raw live when The Rock came back. I didn't expect him to come back. I was just, mm-hmm. I just happened. I was like, oh, let me put this on. And then he came back. I was like, oh, shit, that shit was yeah. crazy um but yeah like to have a moving like that man but yeah what do you think uh yeah i i i, I think it's gonna be like aj it, it's gonna be some like safe but like dope pick like i would love to see aj versus yeah. rock live so i i think i'm a rock with that but uh speaking of aj we saw that uh aj took edge's challenge for wrestlemania man we're, we're going to see and the radar superstar came back out the master manipulator we saw a low blow we saw concertos so edge is going full negative once again i, I love babyface aj styles like I, I know he's a great heel but i love him as a babyface too so we're, we're, we're gonna see the phenomenal one versus the master manipulator at wrestlemania who you got taking the w edge or aj styles this is really 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 tough um this is really really tough i think yeah this is really tough and my for some reason the first thing that's popping in my head is like aj wins Mm -hmm. um and it would be weird um for edge if it wasn't for the fact that he just showed us that he was about to turn heel. I think Edge can lose as WrestleMania, at WrestleMania, put on a great match as a heel, and then still stay where he is right now with the fans, which is that they're excited to see him every time he, they, he comes out mm-hmm. or whatever. Because um, it's very clear that he's not here to do some like um, seven month, one year, or even two year shit. Edge is about to wrestle till this nigga can't wrestle no more, bro. Mm-hmm. Like this nigga is still he's staying for a while. Yeah. So when you think about that, and and he likes the long form storytelling. When you think about that, it's like since he's been back, he hasn't gotten a chance to get in his rated R superstar bag or whatever. Um, and we have like the new fans who weren't around for that, the kids who were just being born who were watching wrestling, like who weren't around for that to see all this nigga was doing salacious, crazy shit at the mm. time or whatever. Like sicko. he was doing stuff, bro. He real sicko mode. Like that, that you talk about sicko mode, this is edge or whatever. So I'm like, oh, this would be an opportunity for him to do that. And if he loses, then he can really be crazy or whatever. Like he can really go crazy. And if he wins. He can have that and, and, you know, he can use that as an ego boost kind of thing. Um, But I like with right now where where I see um, Edge is I see him being more of like a psycho. Um, He's a master master manipulator, but like the way is the way he emotes now. It's much more of like a torn, like his like his motions are torn and he seems more like impulsive Mm -hmm. um at times like it's thoughtful ahead of time but in the moment it seems impulsive like with the concerto like the way he i watched the whole thing the way he pulled it off uh great i see you was going for that emmy too by the way (laughs) go ahead um but yeah no i i honestly i think it's aj i think that it's a classic um I, i feel like they put on a 20 minute 25 minute classic uh, maybe even 30 i'd be happy with i i will please give me the 30 um a classic and aj wins and i think the, the way that aj wins is he reverses 
edges like scheming ways on him and then he goes because they they're setting it up already like edge is already like wilding off off rip so in order to it's already clear that if aj wants to win he's gonna have to like flip that on his head and i think he does it at wrestlemania but yeah but yeah that's that's my thoughts what do you think yeah man it's uh i think this is going to steal the show to be honest like i i I think this is going to be the best match on on the card so i'm very excited for that um i got i got i got aj winning as well man i i think it's kind of like you said edge doesn't lose anything like if if we look at his his record since coming back royal rumble 2020 he beat randy and then then he lost to randy he came back he won the royal rumble he lost to wrestlemania and they took some time off he came back he lost to roman beat seth lost to seth beat seth so like He's he's won more than he's lost, but he's lost a good amount. But every loss is like every loss has made sense. Every loss has contributed to a story. And it's it's been a great match regardless. And I think that he's got a, a lot of respect for AJ. And um I I I think that this is could potentially lead to something more. Like, you know, it doesn't have to end at WrestleMania. We're, we're seeing these days of WrestleMania, which used to be, you know, a a show of blow-offs, is now like continuing stories or starting stories so it's very possible we could see this match between them and then we could see a gimmick match you know at the next pay-per-view and you know to see them f- finish it off at SummerSlam for the U.S. title or something like you know th- there's so many different ways that they can go but I think on the grandest stage of them all um I think I think Ed is gonna is gonna you know pull out a classic uh AJ is going to obviously do his best work Edge is gonna get dirty. He's he's gonna get sneaky. The ref, you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be like a ref bump and Edge pulling out a chair or something. And AJ overcomes, and then Edge is just gonna be a thorn in his side because the, the, this is such a great story too. Because Edge is saying, "Yo, someone come out and challenge me. I'm gonna make you a legend." So he he he's talking that shit. He's real cocky, as if like, yeah, like I'm gonna make you a legend. You're gonna have a great match with me, but uh, but I'm 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 gonna beat you. So for him to lose and be going psycho already, that's just going to take him like even further psycho. He's going to be like, like, oh, like, bro, like you, you was talking all that shit saying you're going to make someone else, you know, and then you, you end up taking the L. So obviously he's, he's going to feel very vindictive as a result of that. I would love to see like them get Beth involved again and her trying to like talk him down and get him to chill out. And like, there's, there's a lot that they can do with this. So I, I think he does take the L at WrestleMania, but it's going to serve something bigger down the road. Um, for our last few, right, man, w- predict one surprise return that we're going to get at uh, WrestleMania. And not necessarily like a superstar that's on the active roster now, but like just one legend who's going to pop up and do something funny, substantial. Hmm. We are in Texas. I got to think about the Texas people. Mm-hmm. Um, I can see Shawn Michaels super kicking somebody who's been talking crap about Texas and kale has been talking a lot. Kale's going to get stunner. Like mm-hmm. I can, like he's been setting up him getting stunner. So we already know Stone Cold's going to stunner him, mm-hmm. but I can see Shawn Michaels popping up and super kicking somebody. Um, I'm trying to think legend status who might come back. Honestly, it's so wide open. Oh, who could they have? They can have a they can have a, a good amount of people. Oh, but you know what? Whose hips still work? Like who, <laughs> who can still move? <laughs> um, outside of the obvious people. I only have one legend that I think is gonna um come back. And I don't like this is not like a you know, uh Twitter fingers like, oh my gosh, I really think he's gonna do it. Um come mm-hmm. back. It's just that I could see it happening. Yeah. If Ro- if Roman unifies that title, Rock is showing up. <laughs> yeah. I'm, it's not guaranteed, but I can see how, because if you think about it, if he unifies the title, Roman will have beaten everyone at that point. Mm-hmm. He will have beaten everyone. There's not really anybody that you can put him up against that's not higher than the other people. So I can see that. But um, but yeah, um, my other, the other one that I'll throw out there, I don't know if he's, um, if he's still around, but um, Blue Meanie. Mm. <laughs> random but but yeah blue mini comes back i don't know mm-hmm. what about you 
You know, I, I, I came up with this question because I was thinking about it too, man. There's a lot of factors that play into it. There's It's Texas, but there's also like, it, it'd be random people popping up. It's like people you didn't necessarily want to see be like, oh, that's cool. Like, you, they're always good for a Jeff Jarrett or, or a Diamond Dallas Page, but like, or, or a boogeyman. So I'm like, well, what direction can they go at this point? Like, maybe Kane will show up or maybe like, we haven't seen Triple H on TV in quite some time. So just to see Triple H would be cool. It's just a matter of like, in what capacity does he show up um i'd love for melina to come back to be honest it was great seeing her in the royal rumble um her her, her honestly I, I was like you know give sasha and melina a match at wrestlemania that's fine but tag tag team title match is cool too um i had someone else in my mind i just completely forgot damn it, it, it's gonna come back to me at some point but yeah man like it's it, it it's it's always like like when Rob Van Dam was there last year, it was amazing to see him. It was like, oh shit, RVD, cool. And he's talking about his rolling papers. That's so fun. But it was like, I don't know, like if, if you if you predicted anyone, you might not have thought Rob Van Dam first. So um I guess it's a matter of who who wants to come to Texas or who they can fly out, you know, no hotel room availability. But um I'm definitely I'm definitely looking forward to WrestleMania regardless. I'm also looking forward to the fact that this month is Women's History Month. We are in March. And for our rewrite today, we want to discuss the evolution of women in the WWE over the last few decades and rewrite some older storylines to be less salacious and more empowering. So I know for me, when I first started watching, um, I I watched SmackDown primarily. So it it was in the midst of Vince McMahon and Sable, you know, having their affair, Tori Wilson, who I loved, and Nydia, who was blind, and Jamie Noble was using her to win matches, and I think Miss Jackie was around at some point. And then um, when I got SmackDown, here comes the pain. That's when they brought in the bra and panties matches. So I was like, oh, this is lit. Like This wrestling shit is great. I'm I'm, going to like this. And then uh, WrestleMania 20, they have that uh, Playboy Bunny evening gown match and things like that. And it was it was always, you know, the the objectification of women. And hey, hey to, the, the fans loved it. We loved watching it. And it was just a very different time back then. And over time, we saw, you know, obviously the, the classic Lita and Trish Stratus main eventing Raw for the women's title. We saw SmackDown introduce a Divas title where Michelle McCool and Maurice and Natalia were fighting over it. We saw the women's title and the Divas title unify and Layla and um, Michelle McCool had their two woman power trip thing going. And then obviously with mid 2000s with the NXT and the four horsewomen coming up, it shifted from the Divas title to the women's title with that match at WrestleMania 32, Charlotte, Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch. And then with the brand split, we got two separate women's titles again, Raw women's title, SmackDown women's title. And I mean, no one can forget the amazing moments like the, the first women's Royal Rumble match, the first women's elimination chamber, the women's main event at WrestleMania 35, Becky Lynch, Ronda Rousey, Charlotte, uh, Beck Bailey and Sasha Banks' classic takeover Brooklyn match. There's, there's, the, it's so dope that we're able to see women not just utilize their beauty, but utilize their athleticism. They're actually able to like wrestle matches now, like older matches, you would just see slaps and hair pulling. And now it's like, they're doing moves. Like they're putting together. Some of the women got better move sets than some of the dudes. Bianca Belair has, has a generational move set. Like she's, she's talking about it. Like she's, she's phenomenal. And she continues to improve it. Charlotte is obviously super technical, super fundamental, like textbook, one of the greatest women to ever wrestle and they're able to carry that star power in addition to just putting on quality matches you actually want to watch like let's be honest man like when when i went back and watched wrestlemania 22 trish stratus versus mickey james not really a great match like not really something that i wanted to see the storyline of mickey being crazy like that was cool and we got to give mickey her credit for being one of the early women to really revitalize how women will perceive beth phoenix uh natalia back in the day um michelle mccool is a big one we talked about her earlier alicia fox uh former divas champion um eve torres like there's there's been a lot of them to come through but i think women's wrestling has never been as big as it is now we look at nxt the the nxt women are are being groomed properly like they're they're being groomed to be amazing wrestlers we got some amazing people in the pipeline io shirai uh, Raquel Gonzalez is is steadily improving. I, I don't love her wrestling, but she's she's getting up there. Cora Jade is going to be great, and Nikita Lyons is the key to world peace. I mean, we just we have we have so much, um, and so with that, with all of this empowerment 
and positivity now, we want to look back and we want to inject it into the past. So, well, what's your rewrite for us, brother? Yeah, man. That first of all, that was a great uh, that was a great recap there. I really like that. I feel like Thank I you, learned man. a lot. Um, <laughs> that being said, you did mention somebody that I would like to talk about. Um, it might be March first, but a surprise, motherfuckers, is still Black History Month to me. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna talk about a woman named Jacqueline. Mm-hmm. Now, Jacqueline debuted in 98 with Mark Merrow um, as his like girlfriend post the stable uh, breakup. Um, and uh, essentially, she was playing the role of the, a lot of the other women in the, um, the WW, WWE at the time, which is just kind of like an eye candy thing or whatever, um, who also wrestled from time to time. But the thing about Jacqueline that you found out real quick is that one, she could actually wrestle. Um, a little bit and then the other thing that she found out is that she had like this attitude and um and not in the the stereotypical black woman has an attitude way but she had this attitude that fit with the attitude era way where she was just willing to take it there um you could hear it in her voice and everything like that so i just thought it would be great um if we could rewrite Jacqueline's story for when she comes in to maybe like a, a year or two a little bit after that so she she still days debuts with Mark Merrill she loses to Sable in a halter top halter top match doesn't forget that shit um <laughs> then Mark Merrill and Jackie then lose to and for those of you who did not know that this happened this actually happened Mark Merrill and, ja- and Jacqueline lost to Edge and Sable at SummerSlam this is I think this is Edge's first year in the wwe if not like during that first year and this is his i'm pretty sure this is his first SummerSlam. um that's what happened at his first SummerSlam. (laughs) um and then yeah so jacqueline also doesn't forget that um but um later down the road i think it's september of that very same year jackie and goza and she wins the women's championship when she defeats sable with merrill's help um um i yeah, there was like some weird thing that happened and she ended up winning. Mm-hmm. Um, so the next, here's my, where my rewrite starts. The next week on Raw, they have a celebration ready. They got all the stuff that they normally have, you know, red carpet um, and the ring. They've got champagne bottles and stuff ready. You know, Jacqueline's happy. Mark Merrill's happy. You know, they do, they talk to the crowd for a little bit, get them riled up because they're heels at the time. And then Mark Merrill pours some glasses of champagne. They go to do the hook thing and drink it together. As they come out from the hook, Mark Merrill goes to kiss Jacqueline and Jacqueline like gives him like the hands to the mouth real quick. And then all of a sudden, all you hear is the, we are the nation, the domination. Like what the hell is going on here? Boom, D'Lo and Mark Henry come out. Now around this time, Mark, Mark Henry was like about to like make his shift to sexual chocolate in that ladies man gimmick. So this still kind of works out um, because at that time, Mark Henry was just uh, a fool for, uh, (laughs) he was just a fool for women at that time. Um, So this works out perfectly. So surprise, the nation of domination has been revived and Jacqueline is actually the leader. Mm. Um, Jacqueline ends up masterminding D'Lo, retaining and uh, keeping the European championship for a year, over a year away from X-Pac. Um, she also uh, masterminds Mark Henry winning the, the Intercontinental Championship somehow, um, and he keeps it for a while. Um, the Nation keeps up. They smoke with DX, obviously, with D'Lo and X-Pac having their stuff, um, and Mark Henry keeping the Interna- Intercontinental Championship, which I think at the time Billy Gunn was gunning for her. Um, and uh, so, yeah, like she's just masterminding all this stuff. And then if you remember at the time, there's not a lot of women in the company, but Sable ends up leaving again because she left and she came back and she left again, Mm -hmm. I believe. Um, So it was really just like China there. So um, with her being the only one there and them having smoke with DX, China's like, yo, like, let me get that. Let me get that up off you. And uh, Jacqueline gives uh, China a title shot at Rubble 99, and she retains after she uses some brass knuckles that D-Lo gives her, um, mm. continues her reign. She just dominates. 
Um, so she continues to dominate as champion as Sable is no longer with the company and she already beat China. So there's like really no com- competition. She cuts a promo saying that she ran Sable out of the WWF. And if anyone wants to step to her, they're going to end up like China or whatever. And then the nation and Jacqueline kind of like take a break from TV for a bit or whatever. You don't really see them for a while. Around this same time in 99, what's brewing is the ministry. The ministry is brewing. And then, so what happens is after the brood get revealed to be a part of the ministry, we see a minion that clearly has like some chest, um, but they have like gloves on or whatever. And then that they catch that minion um, backstage in the dark, like beating on China or whatever. And then it just goes like really dark and then it kind of goes back to the commentators and they don't know what's going on. Um, fast forward to, I think it's, I think this is, is this WrestleMania that this happens at? It's either WrestleMania or SummerSlam. But Undertaker ends up hanging the boss man, and boom, Jacqueline reveals that she is the mistress of the ministry. Um, she cuts a promo saying that she's been working with Undertaker. She hasn't just been pulling the strings when it comes to the Nation of Domination. She's also been pulling the strings when it comes to the ministry. And then, but at some point, you know, this is the Undertaker we're talking about. He's big. He's the big boss or whatever. So it's not like he's really listening to people. So there's some tension there. And then eventually, um, let's call it Survivor Series. She pushes her luck with trying to control like the Undertaker, and she ends up dropping the title to China when uh, when Undertaker distracts her or whatever. But yeah, she gets to have like a long, drawn out run. She gets her own faction or whatever. And if you notice. None of this is based on sex or like her relationship to a man. It's just her just out here wilding and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, that'd be cool if Jacqueline had that. So, yeah, that's my rewrite. That's beautiful. I like that. I like that. So I'm going to take it to 2003. Now, if y'all remember 2003, this was when Vince McMahon was in the midst of a feud with his daughter, Stephanie McMahon. Now, he had the running affair with Sable. Um, and he asked, he asked Stephanie McMahon to resign as the SmackDown general manager. Stephanie obviously didn't. So Vince is like, all right, we're going to f- face off in an I quit match. They face an I quit match at No Mercy, which Stephanie loses because her mother, Linda McMahon, throws in the towel on her behalf. Now, the I quit match was gruesome. It, it was very, very crazy to watch. Uh, it was just very, very nasty. And this influences the return of Shane McMahon. So Shane McMahon comes back. He's like, Dad, like, you got to really look at what you're doing to our family, like on national TV in front of people, like sit down and rewatch the match. So Vince rewatches the match. He's brought to tears. He's like, I can't believe I'm doing this to my family. Can't believe I'm doing this to women. This is horrible. So Vince goes through a couple of weeks of sensitivity training after sensitivity training. Cause you know, <laughs> you know, they would do some shit like this. <laughs> you know, they would do some sensitivity training on TV. So, so we see Vince in, in his sessions and he's, Oh, why, well, why would I respect a woman? Bro? Oh, what? My God. But they're, they're here for our pleasure. What do you mean? Like, you know, stuff like that. And then we see him slowly peeling back his layers. So after his sensitivity training is over, it's actually like two weeks before some uh, survivor series. So Vince is like, all right, um, I've, you know, I've, I've come to my senses. I'm changing my ways. Stephanie, please stay as, as general manager. Linda, I'm sorry that I've, you know, been, been cheating on you on national TV. It's never going to happen again. Here's what I'm going to do to make up for it. I'm going to create a, another woman's title called the Divas title exclusive to SmackDown. So he's, he's starting the, the, the Divas championship a couple of years earlier than it actually happened. I think it happened around like 2008-ish, 2009-ish. So Vince is going to do it a little sooner. He So he, he, he has a four-woman tournament between Nydia, Tori Wilson, Shaniqua. I don't know if you remember Shaniqua. She, 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 she was with the Basham brothers. Shaniqua, yeah, yeah. Going yeah. back. Shaniqua. And Sable's in the tournament. <laughs> and Stephanie is like, um, Sable, like, why? Dad, like, aren't you going to stop, like, with her? Like, why are you giving opportunities? Like, no, I'm, I'm still going to get with Sable, but, you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm having this tournament for women. I'm d- doing better things for women. Like, be happy with it. So the, the, the first round, it's uh, Shaniqua versus Tori Wilson and Sable versus Nidia. Shaniqua upsets Tori Wilson, and Vince helps Sable defeat Nidia. So at uh, Survivor Series, it is Shaniqua versus Sable. Sable looks like she's about to win. Vince gets up, turns on Sable, helps a black woman beat the woman who he was cheating on his wife with. And then Shaniqua is the inaugural Divas champion 
crowned at Survivor Series. And of course, Vince pulls up and he starts doing his little dance. And he's like, yo, 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 shorty. Like, you know, he's he's just trying to like talk ebonics to her and stuff. And like Shaniqua gives him that look and then walks away. Um, but yeah, I feel like at, in this time, the women on SmackDown were really just floundering. So to give them something to do, you, you just create the, the, that Divas title earlier. There's not many of them. You'd end up having a lot of the same matches, but th- there were a lot of women c- coming up that pipeline. A couple of years later, we got uh, Joy Giovanni, uh, Candice Michelle. The, they were doing the Raw Diva search, and a lot of women that were on the Raw Diva search ended up being part of the rosters anyways. Michelle McCool was around you know, um, a, a lot sooner than she became who she was, Kelly Kelly, women like that. So, you know, you you start that title earlier, you give the women on SmackDown something to do. They're probably only going to get like 10 to 15 minutes each weekly show. But um, crowning a black woman as the inaugural Divas champion, having Vince go through sensitivity training and create this whole tournament for women, um, apologizing to his wife, apologizing to his daughter. Um, I, I, I think it would make some really great TV and it, it's just a cool way to empower some of the women there who were talented. Like, I don't think Tori Wilson ever got a run with a title. So eventually she could be Shaniqua. N- Nidia, I thought was pretty cool. You could have done some stuff with Nidia. Like, so, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's my rewrite. Oh, I'm fucking with that. I love, <laughs> I love how we both had, uh, black women winning uh the, t- the title for her. <laughs> it was like it's not just women we're gonna mm-hmm. also make sure <laughs> mm-hmm. yes sir mm-hmm. yeah no i'm fucking with that yeah i um i yo you threw it back with shaniko bro god damn <laughs> that, that that caught me off guard. Bro, as, I, I like that read. as i was thinking about this and thinking about the era i was like yo the basher the basher brothers ran with some black chick who was like their uh D- dominatrix what was her name? So mm-hmm. I, I googled it. I was like, Shaniqua, of course, man. Like she, you know, she was brolic too. Like she was scary. She Bro. was like, she was scary. <laughs> Beat some ass, man. Oh, man she man. was like, she had that, she had that Jay Cargill uh, physique. Bro, she, she literally, like, she was literally, yeah. So, yeah, man. Um, you know, again, we're we are we're happy to bring you all some Women's History Month influenced. Uh, rewrites. We will have another one for you for the month of March. Um, damn, it's it's early, so we might have a couple. I, I gotta check the calendar to make sure what we're doing. But Chan Chan will be back. Um, Chan, it's good Chan wasn't here because he planned to just give you all some uh, empowering bra and panties matches, um, which I don't think we're all that empowering anyway. So you know, <laughs> y'all can y'all can hit him on the side. Maybe he'll make some individual Patreon content for y'all. Um, but, uh, yeah, that is our rewrite for the day, empowering the divas era. Um, it is the boy Armand, the John Cena of journalism, Brock Lesnar of Ball Nigga Ballers, and Paul Heyman of podcasting. Here with my guy, Seth Rollins, a.k.a. CC, best rap producer in the whole wide world. I'm not going to do the whole intro this time because sure. we're closing. But we are the men with the pen. This is another episode of Rewriter's Room, and we will see y'all real, real soon. <laughs>